All right. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. I do have a paper associated with this talk. It's on my website and on LingBuzz. I have not been brave enough to share it with Jeff yet. And I thank Brett for already finding a mistake with regard to CGEL in there, in addition to some useful examples. So I'd love comments and feedback from everyone except Jeff. And maybe in about 10 months, be ready to share it with Jeff officially. Um, I, and I, this is a shorter version of that paper. I have tons of appendices because I'm a more nervous person than Polly, and I don't know what's coming. Uh, right, so the, the story for this talk takes us all the way back to the turn of the millennium. I was a first year grad student at UC Santa Cruz, and I was taking math linguistics from Jeff in the winter. Uh, and he, one day, I think they were deep in the work on CGEL, Jeff introduced the preposing and PP construction to us, like incredible though it seems, we decided not to pursue it. And then he observed for us that this is a long distance dependency construction, incredible though we know that they will think that it seems. And I think we all nodded in agreement. Of course, that sounds like a perfectly grammatical version of the hip construction. And then after saying that, Jeff issued a challenge. He said he'd give us $1 for each naturally occurring hip cl um, clause spanning a finite clause boundary presented by the next week. I assume that Jeff issued the challenge because they had been trying to find these examples for CGEL and been unsuccessful at that point. Now, at the time, I had a great, oh yeah, the, you can see why they were concerned about this. This is the kind of, kind of summary of the CGEL treatment of uh, the PIP construction, and it's got a preposed phrase up there inside a PP and then this un unbounded dependency relationship down into this predicator construction. So in a way, they were kind of predicting that these things would span finite clause boundaries, and I think been unsuccessful in finding attested cases. But, you know, we all nodded. They sound perfectly fine with multiple clauses. Now, at the time, I had a good habit of collecting naturally occurring examples that had just caught my eye as a reader. And pips are unusual enough that you know, before Jeff had issue, issued his challenge, I had collected a few. I think I, they just sounded unusual to me. So here are two of them. And in reward for presenting these, Jeff gave me a nickel <laughs> in front of the class. Uh, not a dollar, but a nickel. Chris, the reward was exponentially increasing through the month, and you didn't bring them in soon enough. But I grant you, you deserve the nickel. <laughs> this is good to hear, Jeff. I have more examples now. Uh, yeah, I kept looking. This really stuck with me. And I learned pretty quickly that relative to these PIP constructions occurring at all, it's fairly routine for them to cross infinitival boundaries, like mild though he knew himself to be. But it was only in 2002 that I finally and triumphantly sent Jeff an attested case from a biography that it turns out we had both read. This is my email to him. Philosophical and unscientific, though he knew they were. Success. In a 2017 paper, Jeff reports that he must have told Mark Davies, or Mark Davies heard of Jeff's quixotic attempts to find these things, and Mark did a search in COCA and found good, though he knew it was. So that was the second case. And then finally, 11 years after issuing the challenge, Jeff finally found a case for himself. This was on the BBC, unpopular, though I can well see that it might be. And Jeff gets a special mention here because this is a case from spontaneous speech. The other ones were presumably edited text. It is a literary construction, so it's noteworthy that it appeared in this way after 11 years. So why did this stick with me? Well, first, I think just as a graduate student, this was a wonderful example of sweating every detail in CGEL. The whole treatment of PIPs is only three pages long in all of CGEL, and the book is like 1,800 pages long. So the amount of investment that was going into every page and every line of CGEL remains an inspiration to me. I'll show you later, like every sentence in the CGEL treatment is its own little investigation, building a characterization of this construction. Uh, and so I've just, I've tried to live by this. I also sense from Jeff's descriptions of PIPs and his rep own reporting to me that he kind of feels a claim isn't secure until it's supported by attested cases. Now, I want to be careful here. Jeff is not a corpus zealot, and you can meet, read many lively papers by Jeff where he goes after people who are obsessed with only corpus examples. But at the same time, 
I sense from Jeff's own email, for example, that you really want attested cases to back up your claims. Like notice, for example, that when he sent that case in 2011, he said, at last, confirmation of the unboundedness from speech. Right, so we have our case. We knew it could happen, but it's still nice to have the example. And from that 2017 paper, there's a really interesting bit of commentary on Mark's case and my own case. He says, this is enough to settle my question about whether the construction can have an unbounded dependency. But he continues, provided we assume a big but familiar syntactician's assumption that if the gap can be embedded in one finite subordinate clause, then it can be further embedded without limit. This is something we all take for granted, uh, but I think Jeff takes very little for granted, and it is nice to have the logic of this spelled out very directly. And then finally, for me, PIPs are the quintessential example of something that can be incredibly rare and sharply defined. PIPs have lots of very special properties despite the fact that they occur almost never in our experiences. And this is just kind of a marvel of human cognition and social coordination. I think where a lot of us are motivated by this seemingly magic thing, uh, and it's really interesting to think about what it takes to characterize such knowledge. So here's my plan. I wanna do a quick frequency analysis of PIPs in massive corpora to substantiate the intuition that they're, that they're really rare. Then I'm gonna do a kind of homage to the CGEL analysis of PIPs using new examples that I found. I have unfortunately very little to add here, but I guess that's a testament to how solid the CGEL characterization is. And then I wanna talk with you about large language models and their capacity to deal with PIPs and what that can tell us about the nature of the knowledge that we're trying to capture. And then I'll quickly sketch for you uh, um, an MTS account of PIPs that I think does a good job of helping us understand everything that comes before this. I'll do that quickly, the full details are in the paper. And then yes, I am here to try to extract some cash from Jeff. <laughs> I have 58 <laughs> examples of PIPs crossing finite clause boundaries now. It took a lot of effort to find those 58 cases in my massive corpora, I am very proud of them. Uh, we'll see what happens. I know Jeff is officially off the hook for the bet. So let me introduce the corpus resources I'm gonna use. The first one uh, is the book open corpus. This is about 18,000 self-published books. It amounts to about 1.3 billion words and 90 million sentences. And I picked this because it's relevant for lots of large language models and it's fairly literary text. And then C4 is the colossal clean crawled corpus. You can think of this as a kind of approximation of the English web. Uh, it's really massive, 365 million documents, 156 billion tokens, and by my parsing, uh, 7.5 billion sentences. It's really big. To get frequency estimates for something like PIPs is non-trivial because they occur almost never, as I said. So here's how I proceeded to get these estimates. Starting with book open corpus, we begin with 90 million sentences. The problem here is that if you sample a thousand sentences from this, this corpus, you're likely to have zero instances of PIPs. And so you sample and you get none, and you sample and you get none, and you don't really learn anything about the frequency. So what I did is write a regex that should have perfect recall on PIPs. So it should miss nothing, that's an assumption here. And that brings us down to about 5.8 million sentences. From there I annotated a thousand of those cases, and I got five positive instances. And by the way, I screwed up this annotation so many times that I annotated about 7,000 sentences in total. And that was enough to train a really good classifier of PIPs. And I used that to find lots of new cases. And that's why I got all the way up to 58 examples, $58 maybe. So five positive cases, and that leads to an estimate of about 30,000 PIPs in the whole of book open corpus. Uh, the bootstrap estimate is similar. And that gives us a frequency estimate of about 0.03% of sentences. I did the same thing for C4. This is exactly parallel, but the numbers are just much larger. 7.5 billion sentences down to 541 million. I annotated 1,000 and got four positive cases. So that leads to an estimate of about 2.2 million there. And again, I'll mention that is relevant because some of the largest language models are trained essentially exclusively on C4. And so you could think of this as a picture of their own experiences. 
Uh, and then finally, that leads to an estimate a little lower than book open corpus, um, but let's call this 0.03% of sentences are pips. Now, that's a hard number to think about, so for comparison, uh, by my own annotation, 12% of sentences in C4 contain a restrictive relative clause. So that they're like 400 times more frequent than pips. And that's a useful number to have in mind. 0.03 is vanishingly small compared to the very common restrictive relative clauses. All right, let's talk about the characterization of pips that is in CGEL. As I said, it's about three pages. They occur elsewhere in the book, but this is really it. And when you go through this, you do find that every sentence is a kind of entire story of some property of the construction. And as you think about that, each of those claims and do your own investigation, you have a sense that you're kind of doing work that Jeff and Rodney already did. It's just kind of inchoate there because we've got just this very compressed description, but an excellent description. Uh, what I'm mainly going to add is a bunch of new attested cases. And I'll mark those. The uh, superscript C is for the C4, and the superscript B is for book corpus open. Start with an easy one, the prepositional heads. Really only as and though are possible here. That's a striking thing. So bad as it was, or young though he was, even distributionally and semantically very similar prepositions do not participate in the construction. So like although it was bad is fine, but that disaster, bad although it was, is ungrammatical and as far as I can tell, unattested. And similarly with things like while, you can try to get creative about this, but it does really seem like it's as or though or bust. Now, I won't have time to go into this too much, but it is striking that as in these contexts can have an additive reading that you would expect from as, as well as a concessive reading. So in this one case, as can seem a lot like though, but pips are not inherently concessive uh, because as can have this kind of additive reading as well. In terms of gap licensing, so this was very particular to pips, very, very particular. Gap licensing, I'm going to claim, is just completely general. Uh, for pips, essentially any predicator can license a gap here in the complement. So the full range of the verbs you'd expect from be all the way up to feel, look, and sound. I think resultatives can license pips. VP complements to modal verbs and inflected do. Um, Brett said, try as I might before. That's a very frequent instance of this construction, so frequent that it took me a second, Brett. You were faster than me. I was like, why is he pointing at me? And then I realized it's that kind of idiomatic pip, try as you might. And then some adverbials. Um, and here are some examples. Uh, I think it's going to be straightforward for me to account for 9 through 13. Uh, 14 with this kind of adverbial thing is harder to understand in terms of what's licensing the gap there. Um, but the point is really that basically anything goes if it's a predicative construction. For what can be preposed, it's similar. I think the, the generalization I would offer is that any property denoting predicate can be a pip in that pre-nucleus position there. So um, obviously adjectives, adjective phrases, anything that could be coaxed into that, nominals that can be property denoting, um, verb phrases as long as they have all their kind of complements so that they're property denoting and so forth and so on. Here are some examples. Tempted to run is a complex adjective phrase. Withered thing, that's a noun phrase functioning as a pre-nucleus. And then struggle, though he might, I assume, is a verb phrase. There is a peculiarity of these pre-nucleus phrases for pips, and that's that you can have a surprise occurrence of a second as. So CGEL says, with concessive as, some speakers have a preposed predicate of adjective modified by the adverb as, as in cases like as spectacular as his career was. Or this is another example I found. As sensitive as she was, she was aware of the gesture and paused. I do want to note, this is maybe my one contribution here, although I have to be careful about this, that is a non-concessive use of this as-as construction. The concessive one would be as sensitive as she was, she wasn't aware of the gesture. So it seems additive now. I thought, aha, this is a sort of correction to CGEL, but the CGEL characterization, that sentence there is very careful. It just doesn't talk about cases that might be additive. It is purely about the concessive ones. So no problems, but maybe worth a note. 
Uh, this is a first case where the pre-nucleus cannot appear in C2. So if you were thinking about a movement account that literally moved the phrase, you'd have some grief here with dealing with the fact that you can get this as here, appearing here, but not in the in C2 versions. And it's a similar story for what I'm going to call missing determiners. So CGEL notes that you have things like bloody usurping sod though you are. That's a noun phrase up there, and it doesn't have its determiner. Uh, though you are a bloody usurping sod, but not though you are bloody usurping sod. Now, again, I think CGEL is careful about this and just points out that you can drop the determiner. I had an intuition that you could keep it, but I couldn't find any examples in actual data, and so I'm thankful to Brett for finding this one in COCA, um, a high crime neighborhood though it was, so it kept the determiner. So the thing to account for here is the optionality of the determiner. Again, not possible if the phrase is left in situ. Modifier stranding is a complicated issue. CGEL covers this in real detail, and I think I'm just following the characterization here when I say that the pip gap should be either the direct complement to a predicator, as you see here, or in kind of the headline of that direct complement and be phrasal. So in this case, seems extremely close to the top. There are two possible pips, which I've given at the bottom here. One of them targets the actual complement to the predicator, and the other one targets uh, the thing that's in the headline there, extremely close. And so the result of this is that you can get lots of modifier stranding to the extent that you have even complement modifiers built up on the right. And then finally, where the real action is for us, long distance dependencies. I've pointed out that it's routine to get pips that cross infinitival clause boundaries. Here are a couple more cases, like guilty though I believe Mars to be. And then here are two new uh, finite clause cases that I found. Honorable though I am sure his intentions were, or heartfelt though she knew it was, both from the book's corpus. So more evidence, maybe two more dollars there. And as I said, I've got 58 spanning finite clause boundaries, and they really were hard won. I guess I want to emphasize this. Remember, we all had the intuition that it's fine for them to, cr them to cross finite clause boundaries, but even by poring over billions of words, using all the power of modern NLP, I found 58. Um, so vanishingly rare. Okay, let me wrap up this characterization here. Here's this kind of schematic picture of the CGEL treatment. We've got property denoting nucleus phrases up there at the far left. We have the possibility of missing determiners in that phrase and a surprise appearance of an adverbial as in kind of gradable versions of the construction. The prepositional heads need to be though or as, no other options there. And it's a long distance dependency construction. And then finally, the gap down here should be a pred comp or a phrasal head thereof so that you can travel down and strand modifiers. So that's the characterization for discussion. Let's reflect. For me in 2000, I was 23. The best case scenario is that I had heard 460 million words in my lifetime. This is really an upper bound. Let's assuming that I did lots and lots of reading. So that means by my frequency estimate that I'd heard uh, around 11.5 thousand pips in my entire life. I've maybe doubled that this summer as part of this project. Um, for comparison, again, 4.6 million restrictive relative clauses by that time. And so just reflect again on how different those, ex those situations are in terms of the evidence that you've amassed to characterize the construction. The constraints that you have to learn from these few experiences are kind of diverse. For the prepositional head thing, it seems like you just have to learn that your actual experiences exhaust the possibilities. 11.5 uh, thousand times I'd heard though or as, and I concluded at some point that no other prepositions were possible. And that seems like a reasonable thing to learn. Fine. But what about this? For the pre-nucleus, we need to go in the other direction. My experiences need to invite a much broader generalization that all property denoting expressions are possible in that position. I did not do that for the prepositions, but here I do it for this very abstract notion of what kinds of phrases can appear there. And the long distance dependency thing is, if anything, more severe. 
because almost all of my very few experiences with the construction were single clause cases. Maybe some infinitival cases in there, but almost none. Maybe no finite clause cases until I finally sent my example to Jeff. And yet, I and we all concluded that they could be unbounded in this, in this sense. So you get here, of course, a very tempting stimulus poverty argument in the sense of Pullman-Schultz 2002, right? This would be of the form, the evidence underdetermines the final state in ways that can only be explained by innate mechanisms. Because there's just no way, you think, that you could possibly, from so few instances, have learned all this stuff that's kind of pulling you in different directions in terms of what generalization you should make. Maybe it's true. It could be true that we need a uh, stimulus poverty argument here. But I want to complicate that, uh, that um, conclusion for you by looking at large language models. So the role that they're going to play here is that large language models are learning agents where we know all the learning mechanisms. Um, and the bottom line is that large language models are kind of in the same position as the rest of us in terms of learning what PIPs are like because they just experience very few of them. But I'm going to show you that they have learned to characterize them and use them in some sense very robustly. And so that should at least call into question the conclusion that you might go for, to for humans that you need a stimulus poverty argument. Maybe it's true for the humans, but the burden is now on you, I would say, because LLMs are also good at this kind of thing. Now, large language models are the paradigm case of a big black box. When you crack them open, all you find is an ocean of parameter values. It's very hard to understand how they work internally. But all we're going to need is access to them at a kind of behavioral level. I do want to say, just by way of pointing this out, that there's lots of work from computational psycholinguists showing that large language models have learned a whole lot about the causal structure of language and a lot about its interpretation. I won't have time to review this evidence, but it's kind of an overwhelmingly positive picture of them from unsupervised learning on sequences of symbols, figuring out a lot about how language is structured. For us, the key char characteristics of these models are kind of that their only objective, for the models I'm going to talk about here, their only objective is to learn from co-occurrence patterns in the sequences that they're trained on. And to give you a sense for this, is a kind of, it's a kind of imitation learning process. Let me just walk you through an example. Suppose that we have this model here, this gray, this gray box. This is an untrained state for the model. We're going to feed in symbol sequences and teach the model to reproduce what, it was, was it, what, what was in its input. So down here, the start symbol, happy though we were, comes in, and it's going to try to re reproduce that by doing next token prediction. So in its initial state, maybe it just predicts beans five times because all it's got is random parameters. But the difference between the outputs we wanted and the things it predicted are its error signal that it can use to update its parameters. And so the next time through, the model state has changed a little bit. Now it's predicting happy five times with one occurrence of though. Next training iteration, maybe after seeing that, you know, millions and millions, billions of words, uh, it's getting a little closer. And then finally, it has learned to reproduce the symbol sequence that it was trained on. That's all that's happening under the hood when these models learn. This is unsupervised pre-training. And then this will be relevant for us, surprisals. This would be a case where we have a trained model, and we feed in a symbol sequence. And there is something, a real divergence between the thing that it gives the highest score to, in this case width, and the actual output that you put in the sequence, which was here happy. And so that would show up as a high surprisal, which is really just a very low score for that word. A bunch of people have done really excellent work using language models to di diagnose whether or not they have knowledge of long distance dependency constructions. I'm going to draw mainly on a new paper from Wilcox et al which is a lovely paper, and it's even more lovely to me that they got it into linguistic inquiry, as this is entirely about large language models. So here's how they work. For the two gap cases, we have things like, I know what the lion devoured yesterday, and I know that the lion devoured yesterday. And they're assuming that because devour is obligatorily transitive, that that case is ungrammatical. And then using the surprisals from the language model, we just take the surprisal for the first, minus the surprisal for the second, and we are expecting large negative values in this case. 
And then they can do the same thing for the no gap cases. Like I know what the lion devoured the gazelle yesterday, that's ungrammatical, versus I know that the lion devoured the gazelle yesterday. Same kind of comparison of the surprisals. And we're expecting here modest positive values in virtue of the fact that when we're doing local processing here, there could be some other gap site that's not the one that's reflected in that full sentence, maybe a gap that comes later. So this will only be modestly surprising here. I did the same thing for pips. So I just followed the template of Wilcox et al. I have little um, 38 sentences or groups of sentences that are like this um, that kind of cover the four cases that they studied. And then you can create embedding invariants by inserting strings like they said that we knew that right before the preposition. And you can vary the preposition and so forth. So you get a full exploration of the possibilities. And the bottom line here is that large language models, this is the ADA model, from, it's a GPT-3 model, the oldest of the GPT-3 models. Uh, very large expected WH effect here and the modest positive effect for the no gap cases here. That's for though. In the single clause, here's though for multi-clause. For multi-clause, the effects are smaller, but still in exactly the expected direction and still very robust. I think in the interest of time, I won't go through the um, work that I did on the prepositional heads, but I was just going to try to show you that you can work with these language models to characterize other aspects of the construction. And here I was just wondering whether or not they knew that though and as were the only possibilities. Uh, for this case, you need to use BERT, which is a bi-directional model, so that you get enough information to know that it's a PIP construction. Um, and the bottom line here is that BERT seems to have very robustly learned that only though and as are possibilities. And it's the same paradigm. You get this very large prepositional head effect in the expected direction, and it flips for all though. The preposition that's very similar that doesn't uh, participate in the PIP construction. That's for single clause, double clause. Models are also really aware that only as and though are true possibilities for that in terms of the ranking that they give to the entire vocabulary. That's also reassuring. The effect diminishes a little bit as you move to the multi-clause cases. It gets more diffuse, uh, but that's maybe something for us to work on as LLM producers. So let me just wrap up with some discussion here. GPT-3 seems to have learned to latently represent pips, at least insofar as it has an expectation that a pip gap will occur conditional on an early filler, that is the pre-nucleus, and the prepositional head needs to be as or though, even in multi-clause cases, which occur again almost never in the training data. The learning mechanisms here are very simple and entirely known to us. You need to learn to assign high probability to attested sequences, and that's it. The human solution could be different, but this here shows that simple mechanisms do suffice even where the evidence is very sparse. We might not know fully why models are able to achieve this, but we know that they do it. And that therefore, as I said, I think the burden of proof is on people arguing for stimulus poverty arguments that humans need to be importantly different for this. I'd wrap this up. Chomsky just, well, this is an older interview. This is from 2017 on Radio Open Source. Uh, they just replayed it, and it, there's this lovely interaction. The interviewer, Christopher Lydon, says, and you said, wait a sec, it's impossible that babies could learn language by imitation in so short a span. And Chomsky kind of interrupts and says, they couldn't learn it by imitation if they had 10,000 years because there's no way to do it. For any reasonable construal of what he means by imitation here, LLMs are doing imitation. Uh, and you could say even that they have experienced approximately 10,000 years worth of text. I'll have to wrap up here. I do in the paper offer an MTS characterization of PIPs. And the bottom line here is that MTS turns out to be a wonderful vehicle for reconciling all of this evidence. Um, what I offer essentially is MTS constraints that are hypotheses about the abstract knowledge that both humans and LLMs have acquired, and that they collectively, those constraints, give rise to PIPs. And the lovely thing about MTS is that you, you offer these constraints as kind of isolated pieces that together comprise the grammar. And then you can think about what it's like, what's necessary for learning those constraints. And the answer can be different in lots of different cases, but it gives you a kind of target for thinking about different kinds of learning agents and what they need to acquire. And the, I'd say the, the bottom line here 
is that the constraints pull in very different directions, right? Some are very PIP specific, but some of them, like the constraint that you offer for the pre-nucleus, are absolutely general to lots of different, predi lots of different predicational long distance dependency constructions. For example, the constraint that I offer on the pre-nucleus is something that you could learn never having encountered a PIP. And the idea is that that knowledge would simply transfer to the PIP context. So you can learn about PIPs even if you never experience them. Right, so here's my conclusion, key takeaways. PIPs are rare, I showed that, for humans and for large language models. Some PIP types have essentially no direct support in the data, but humans and LLMs are nonetheless proficient with the construction. And I've shown you, I hope, that very simple learning mechanisms do suffice to explain the proficiency. I wanted to point out that my brand new student, Julie Kalini, Julie is a computer science student, but she's a linguist at heart. Um, I told her about the project. She's working with Baby LM, which is a new data set designed to kind of help people who are doing computational psycholinguistics think about the role language models could play. Uh, and she found a few cases. And I bought her a fancy coffee in response for these <laughs> cases. And that's an $8 value, uh, no exaggeration, at Palo Alto. So I'm, I'm financially the more generous advisor so far. <laughs> I want to offer a few additional cases just to wrap up here. So I was initially motivated by Jeff's challenge to find PIPs spanning a finite clause boundary. And I've met the challenge. As I said, there are 58 in the paper. But remember, Jeff said he was very cautious in that 2017 paper. Uh, provided we assume a big but familiar assumption that if the gap can be embedded in one finite subordinate clause, then it can be further embedded without limit. And I certainly heard this as a call to action. It's a puzzling call to action because I think we agree that seeing one that had multiple finite clause boundaries would teach us really nothing. As human language learners, it teaches us nothing. And also, as linguists, it teaches us nothing. But it just does seem important based on what Jeff said here. So here are some cases. Doubly embedded, finite clause cases. Well-intentioned, though many people may have imagined that the CIA probably thought they were, and so forth and so on. It's not three. I didn't find three, but I did find two. So thank you. Okay, so I'm, I, I hope I can phrase this question coherently. <laughs> Um, and I'm glad you brought up the thing at the end about that we all assume, so you assume, I assume, Jeff assumes, we all assume that if you can, you know, find one that's embedded once, you can find one that's going to be embedded twice, three times, whatever, and you didn't find any more than two, and you probably won't. But, so what I want to say is that given that we all assume that, um, it seems to me that that only follows, given certain assumptions about the structure of what's going on here. And if it was just really all unstructured stuff that just was caring about co-occurrence restriction, as far as I understand it, there's no reason to make that assumption. We make that assumption because we are making certain assumptions about the structure of how grammars work beyond just what the LLMs would have. And so right away, it seems to me that you, you Jeff, everybody else in this room, are saying that there is this kind of structured knowledge there that is being brought to the task. Otherwise, you wouldn't get that assumption. Wouldn't well, but, so no, but the, the punchline here is that these same models have learned a ton about constituency, the scope for negation, lots of very rare constructions. I mean, mine is frequent compared to the one that Kyle Mahowald studies yeah, but, in that uh, paper. Uh, that, so they have, I think that this is actually important here. All of these things that they've learned are ingredients in their being successful at PIPs. I know. Including I mean, things like constituency. But, but that, that doesn't really address the point that there is this hidden assumption, or that Jeff made explicit, that if we could find it crossing one finite clause boundary, we could find it crossing n number of finite clause sure. boundaries. And that, I mean, all this stuff's fine, but that's not, that doesn't address that point. And that point is sort of admitting that there's something going on that is beyond just what these LLMs could do. No, but that's the distinction I'm calling into question. When you say what these LLMs do, I'm saying to you what they do is everything about language. 
They manage long distance dependencies. They know about constituents. Do they, they know? know do they know that, yeah. that you can get it? You know that by by people. I think they have latent knowledge of that the same way that we do. How that's would what you show my that? term, That's what I showed with PIPs. So you know, like my embedding for those experiments is two clauses. So I found three of those. So it's not unattested. But like right, for this multi clause clauses. case, right? Well, we all get, believe it could be four clauses. Down. I think it would be the same effect. Yeah. How could you show that? I would just extend my little experiment. I, the the embedding that I learned that I used was two, right? And I would just do yeah this one. One two. So I did two, but I would just do three of the four, and I would just probe to see. Right. Yeah, but again, I, the the point here is not to call into question any of this stuff, but rather just to observe that it does seem to be real. In fact, it's so real that a simple learning agent like a large language model induces it as part of its learning and then leverages that knowledge to produce language and to understand language. So it's a kind of new reification of all these constructs in my view. Chris? Jeff. Um, one of the things to remember from back in 2000 when uh, I was at Santa Cruz and posed the challenge and so on, was that as, as I recall, out of your entire cohort, not one graduate student showed the slightest interest in trying to look and nobody brought me anything, it was only <laughs> you. And at the time I was beginning to think uh, what I'd really like to see in a distant future, uh, because I'm, you know, it's, uh, I'd like to be really hopeful that things can develop and improve, is people who have a really hard theoretical view of things and are not corpus fetishists. They don't think that linguistics should be reduced to just play with statistics on finite corpora, but they are really concerned to make sure that they base their generalizations on stuff that can be illustrated from uh, attested material. And I could now at least name about five people who are very actively showing that kind of um, combination. Uh, and interesting, interesting to me that five, all five of them are in this room. That would be you, Jim Donaldson, John Payne, Brett Reynolds, and Philip Miller, who is, as I, as I see it, expert in using corpora, but absolutely concerned with theoretical linguistics. That's an enormously uh, helpful development to well, me. So you will count Julie as another. So because Julie did this unprompted by me, I just shared the paper with her and she was working with KBLM. She right. found them on her own. And by the way, it says I promised Julie a coffee. The reason it says that is that I tried to buy her this coffee so that I could change the slide, but she refused my coffee. And I said to her, Julie, that's noble of you, but I am going all the way to Edinburgh to try to get $58 from you. It's making me feel awkward. <laughs> but she's still on the scene. And this is just three of the cases that she found, including this very strange one that I'm not even sure is a pick. I recall a time <laughs> limit on the, how soon they came from. It's great that you went on looking for them. Jeff, you, you, you owe them a question. Uh, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> you, you did mention Steve Piantadosi's paper on this. Do you regard him as basically correct in saying this really knocks it on the head for the poverty of stimulus argument. He said that rather polemically, you did not. You were rather cautious and showing how yeah. LMs, what they do really teach us. Would you approve of what Steve Bienvidelsi does in his recent paper? Well, he, I, I do cite the paper, Steve's paper in my own, uh, but he's a kind of zealot. I'm much more cautious. I'm trying to be careful about this. There might be a stimulus poverty argument lurking here uh, because language models are very different creatures and their experiences of the world are very different from ours. Um, but you can't rush to it. Like from the evidence that I presented, the argument doesn't go through. It needs to be an argument that's very tightly connected to human cognition and human experience. And it's just gonna be much harder to make as a result. I think ambitious people should try to make the argument. I'm worried, I will say, that this kind of thing that is happening, so I'm not the only person who's made arguments like this, is causing people in the field to disavow this argument and instead say that the one they always said was important was the one about typology. 
And they say the reason large language models are not relevant is because they could learn unattested as well as attested languages. Yes. That's also an interesting question, a non-trivial one, and there is no evidence for it in the literature beyond Chomsky repeatedly saying it and then yeah. people quoting him, but there is no actual paper showing this. Um, and I also think it's gonna prove to be wrong, but it's also tragic for me that people are saying this was never their question because this just comes up against my own lived experience in the field. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of lots of people in the room of now hearing people say that this question was never important simply because there has been progress on it, I find that endlessly frustrating. And also I will say indicative of some of the failings of linguistics. Yeah, yeah. Building the goalposts. Thank you.